What it do, what it do. This is the Brothers on Books podcast. We find great books that will give you real value and actionable steps and have fun in the process. Please reach out to us at brothersonbooks at gmail.com for any book recommendations or if you'd like to be a guest host for a particular book you have in mind. A great review or rating on whichever platform you're listening to this would be greatly appreciated. If you can think of any friend, family member, or coworker that might like this episode, please pass it along. For the original episodes, the OGs, please visit brothersonbooks.com. We are now in connect with Enter Matcha. This is ceremonial grade matcha. And if you use the discount code below or and or link, you get 10% off your matcha. Um, so that's pretty cool. I'm Jack Allwile. With me, as always, is my brother, Alex Allwile. Al, how are we doing tonight? I'm doing pretty good, Jack. Now I'm tired. It's, uh, it's been a long Wednesday. We had my, uh, you know, importantly, I have my first uh, Airbnb guest with me in my new house. Nice. Everything is everything is moved smoothly along. They're very nice and friendly. Uh, and most importantly, I won my first round match of my uh, ping pong tournament at work. Dominated my coworker. Oh, I... Ping pong tournament at work. I actually uh, forgot you guys had ping pong tables there. We have singular table. We have one. Uh-huh. One table. Okay. Okay. One table. And then someone brings their someone brings their personal table in, so we have two go on. But during the week, someone brought their table into work. Yeah, so we could have this tournament. Now that is dedication. <laughs> that is that is pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, jokingly, I'd be my one coworker so badly. I jokingly said at five o'clock, you know, he needed to go take uh, the rest of the day off because he was feeling so blue. Mm-hmm. But uh, he informed me that it was really just to go pick up his son from daycare. Who mm. knows what the truth is? Yeah. Maybe maybe he needs lessons uh, from you in uh, pickleball and ping pong, so... You know, I felt, I have to say, it was the first time I had played ping pong since uh, last year's tournament. Uh, and I felt, everything felt incredibly awkward going back to trying to hit a ping pong ball. It, it felt very weird. Interesting. But uh, I guess with that said, Jack, uh, you know, what book are we doing? We are reading Reconnaissance Man by Aaron Clary, the man, the myth, the legend, we saw him in episode 22, Book of Numbers, and episode 43, Sandy is the Future of Wealth. And this is a man that I can't even remember how I first found him, but uh, or found the Book of Numbers. But it is, uh, he's very enjoyable to read, and I've really enjoyed reading his books. Unfortunately, he can't join us tonight, but we have scheduled a future date to have him on for yet another Aaron Clary classic. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm excited to discuss this book. I think it's got a lot of good things to draw from and yeah, why don't we start with you? What were your initial reactions to this book? Well, I guess to start with, I think he is our first, uh, three time author. Is that, is that correct? I think, I guess is, wouldn't he be our first two time author too or no? Uh, no, we had done Robert Green. We had done twice. But but was but was Aaron Clary the first one to be twice? Uh, Aaron Clary, I think, would have been the first one to be twice. I mean, the the second book was a solo episode by you. That's true. That's true. Um, so we did both. Both you and I did Robert Green together, and technically, collab we both did together with uh, Black Swan and Dynamic Hedging. Ah, good call. Yeah, yeah, the episode with Mark Longo. Yeah, but he is, I think, definitely our first three time. Yep. So I guess my my initial thoughts, I guess, just a general breakdown of the book. Uh, He talks about how, I mean, I I guess just initially, I thought the book was good. A lot of value. Um, Talks about how people waste a lot of, I mean, my general thoughts were, he talks about how people waste a lot of time and money, kind of more or less being lost not really knowing what they want to do or where they want to do it and then just kind of going to school and kind of being get getting swept up in the stream of life 
And you just kind of like meander around aimlessly until you wind up living in a situation that you don't necessarily like. So I guess the first thing he said that really before you go to college to, I wish I would have uh, thumbed down the page to get, he had some very colorful wording for some of the degrees people are getting. <laughs> I think he used, uh, you know, black African Latinx female study literature at one point or something yeah. along those lines. <laughs> wow. That sounds right. So I think the, let's see if I can find the page with the quote, but the first thing he said, you need to ask yourself three questions, which are, who am I? What do I want to do? And where do I want to live? Um, and he, he said that, the first two questions, who am I, what do I want to do, are the most important and the hardest to figure out. But he claims that where do I want to live is the question you need to answer first. And that is what the entire premise really of the book is about how you can go out into, I mean, we, the book only talks about the states, how you can go out into the states, kind of travel why you're young, sort of see the country uh, and figure out really why you want to live. Uh, so I guess to start with, I thought uh, make some good points. I definitely, I definitely thought about moving to other cities for uh, better pickleball. I, mm -hmm. I would be lying if I, if I would say that I haven't thought about moving to South Florida or to Austin or to even like San Diego, uh, just so I would have access to better players, able to play all year round, more people, so I could just myself get better easier. Uh, so he makes that point where, and he actually talked about this in the book of numbers, like to, to an extent, like, uh, you know, if, if you really like hiking or whitewater rafting or skiing or whatever, X, Y, and Z, you should live in a place that's conducive for those activities because then not only will you be able, I think the social aspect that he brings up is also important. Like, not only will you, one, be able to do the activities that you like, you'll also be more outgoing and you'll tend to meet other people that like doing those activities that you like. And it will enable you, I think, to build a stronger friend group. And I think that message also resonated very deeply with me. Uh, most of my friends uh, here, I met playing pickleball. And even back when I was in Nashville, before I played pickleball, I played a real lot of soccer. And most, almost all of my friends, I either met, you know, just doing sports, playing soccer, and playing pickleball. And those were the things that I liked doing. So I think. For me, it would make some sense to move to a place that had uh, more access to play. Mm -hmm. So, guess, so okay. Uh, so let's let, let's pause for a second and think about. So here's a question. So so he brings up those three questions, but he reverses the order in which you should solve them or answer them because he he's saying the premise, according to him, is. You know, the the question, who am I and what do I want to do are like, I guess, too tough to answer. Is that kind of be, because it takes like life experience? Is that kind of why? That, that was, yeah, that was the gist of what I got. Uh, I don't even really understand like how you answer the question, who am I? Like, I don't mm -hmm. really know. Like, do, I mean, do you know how to answer that question? Like, who are you? <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's, I mean, it's a tough question. And I guess that that's his point. Like, it takes like a long time to be able to answer that. <laughs> so so maybe you're better off going to try to answer, you know, the question, where do I want to live? It, it does determine a lot of, you know, your environment. And they talk a lot of, about this in terms of habits, too. Like, it's good to work on your environment, not it, not necessarily try to change a habit change the environment because who you're around and what types of environments you're in really dictate who you become 
And, and, and from his point of view, like when you're trying to find a city, what types of jobs will be available? Um, and I, I, yeah, I would have been curious what he thought about this age of, uh, work a lot more working remotely, but, um, yeah, it's definitely interesting to think about how much the city dictates who you become. And he also brings up certain groups, uh, and why it's so hard to move once you're settled and you have roots. Cause he brought up, I think it was Baghdad. Um, you know, he asked the question, why does Baghdad still have like 7 million people? Well, it's because oh, even though, even, cool. even though it's like a, like a, you know, a war zone, a lot of the time, um, why does it have so many people? It's because, you know, people have settled and they get uncomfortable moving and, uh, it's, it's hard to leave once you, you have good connections. I mean, he also brought up the Jews actually, why did they wait to, you know, they were getting sent in cattle cars to, you know, well, why didn't more people just leave before it's, it's hard. Um, well, I mean, you know, there, there's also something to say, you may not, not be able to leave. Like you may not yeah. be able to leave the country. Like yeah. there's a difference between, you know, you go into a different part of, a Afghanistan, like it's probably not a whole lot better than Baghdad. Uh, I guess there's a statement to be made about, you know, the Jews not leaving. But yes, I, I agree with you. Once you have roots in the city, you have social connections, get comfortable with what's going on there. It is very difficult to pack up and leave. I mean, we've both done it though. Like you, you right. packed up and left Ann Arbor. You, I was, uh, you know, I don't know if I ever told you this, but I remember when you did that, I was shocked. You, uh, you were shocked that I left. I was shocked that you left. Yeah, really, right? Because I mean, one of the, one of the reasons I left was because you left. <laughs> because oh, really? because because I remember the first January that I went to visit you and we were playing soccer outside in January. It was like an aha moment for me. It was like, what the heck am I doing, freezing in winter when I like what at the time what I like to do was you know play soccer. And if, if I can do this like all year round in some other cities, yeah, sign me up. I don't want to be walking around with the inside of my nose freezing over every time I go to the gym. And, and that's what my last two winters in Michigan were like during the polar vortex. And I think Aaron Clary, I mean, I, I, I would have liked to have asked him where he's living now because it sounded like he was, a little bit regretful for staying in Minnesota so long. And I, I think he was going through some of those emotions that at least I was going through. Like, I'm just tired of the cold. Like <laughs> I, I want to experience some, you know, warmth and be active. And I, I just found that it's, it's hard to be super active when you're freezing all the time. Like, in, but now in Charlotte, like it's great nine months out of the year the su the summer is i mean like i mean he was talking about phoenix being unbearably hot and i would say a lot of the southeast is probably similar and more humid so uh it's also borderline unbear unbearably hot <laughs> but uh yeah. I, I i i mean it was i mean looking back i'm, I'm very happy i moved and i i was gr grateful that uh Aaron Clary did not put North Carolina on the no-go zone. <laughs> but I guess, I guess uh, sort of, uh, I'll, yeah. So the reason I was shocked that you left was because I, I just remember when I would look, sort of look at your, or my perception of your life, it seemed like you had a lot of really close friends in Ann Arbor and mom and dad were there. And yeah, I just remember, I think maybe part of it was that when I moved to Nashville, I had such a hard time making friends. I just remember thinking like when you were leaving, I remember thinking like, why would you give up all these really, I mean, not, not that you gave up, I mean, you're so close to those people, but like on a day-to-day -day basis, like why would you give up all those connections is what uh, sort of surprised me. Yeah. I mean, and to his point, it gets, it gets the, the longer you wait, the harder it's going to be. Cause, but, yeah. but yeah, the, the, the people that there's a bunch of those Ann Arbor people I'm still very close with. I mean, in fact, one of the guys I lived with, who is one of my closest friends, Tony, 
he came and stayed with us in Charlotte for a full month, a couple of months ago. So that was really great that we still get to see him a lot. And I still feel like I travel back to Michigan amount and get to see them. So, uh, yeah, but it definitely gets harder with time. Yeah. I mean, so the other, the other point went about the, the climate of where you live, uh, when he was, when he was making his criteria, it, I will say my one criticism is it seemed somewhat inconsistent <laughs> because there were states, there were states that he was like, you know, that place is unbearably cold. Like I'm just crossing it off. But then he left Montana and Alaska on the list. Exactly. Like, yeah. <laughs> you, can only be, you can only be in Montana and Alaska for like two months of the year before, you know, Alaska's, you know, if you're there between like October and like June or May or whatever, it's like dark, like 20 hours of the day. Uh, I mean, but, but he, I will, I will give him, I will concede the point that when he brought up Alabama, which where I now live, and I will say that I actually thoroughly enjoy living in Alabama. He did say the summer is sweltering hot, uh, sort of like what you were saying. And I can attest to that fact that that is very true. Mm-hmm. It has been, you know, over 90 degrees close to, I mean, even like 95 would be a low and incredibly humid and if you're more or less walking outside for more than 10 minutes you come back in at least me uh, i sweat quite a bit you come back in like a puddle Mm -hmm. Uh, so that has been you know but the 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 winter like like you were saying when i was in tennessee the winters are very pleasant and i was just up in michigan about a month ago oh and I remember having a text conversation with one of my friends thinking, you know, I never used to get why all those old people would go to Florida in the, in the winter and in, in summer in Michigan. But uh, I think that's my new goal. I, I need, I need enough money and enough freedom that I can, uh, you know, summer, summer back home and then winter, winter down here. Yeah. Uh, so I don't have to deal with the unbearably cold winters and the unbearably hot summers. Yeah. He was okay. So in the book of numbers, when he was going through like the deal breakers, it was kind of funny to see. It's kind of like he repeated that same type of thought process in eliminating some of these states, like the like what he was calling like the no go zones or um, you know reasons for climate. Those were like deal breakers. I I, I thought I saw some similarities between book of numbers and here, like when he's oh, yeah. you know. Pick, pick, yeah, picking girls versus picking states. Uh, so that was, that was pretty funny uh, to see. Um, what did you think of? So b- basically, and, and this is, t- I mean, really, ideally, it's for people like still in high school, but you, you'd have to be very intentional and very mature at that point, I think, to consider doing something like this. But what he's what he's pitching is basically try to save up to do like two weeks every summer like I guess starting at 16 or 17 and go to one segment of the country and just drive around and do what he called, you know, reconnaissance of the area. And um, what did you think of like the logistics of that, that, that I, I guess that whole idea of doing reconnaissance of little areas each, each summer. Yeah, so I guess just to start, I, I actually think doing that at 16 would more or less be a waste. Uh, I, I don't think a 16-year-old would have, well, one, I don't think they would really know what they, I'm speaking in averages. Obviously, there would be some 16-year-old that would know exactly what they want. But the majority of 16-year-olds six, aren't, aren't going to know what they want in the city. Uh, He talks about taxes a ton. How many 16-year-olds do you think pay attention to taxes of, like, states or cities or townships to, like, have, you know, to think about the difference between living in, like, San Diego versus uh, Phoenix? Mm -hmm. I don't think there are a whole lot of 16-year-olds that would have that together. But but do do you think that's kind of like his point that like we don't really think about this until it's too late? So he's kind of giving you a blueprint to like, here's what I mean, he's not saying don't go to those other places necessarily, but like 
this should be a consideration. And not to say that, I mean, the, those taxes can change also. So, right. Um, um, I, I guess in terms like, I think, I think about, I think about like where I want to live uh, in a much different, like maybe focus than what he does. Like, cause mainly when I'm thinking about like where I want to live, I would like a city that is, in terms of population, kind of between like 250 and a million uh, people, just because in my experience, when I've been in cities around those sizes, the traffic, while at times can be bad, it's not unbearable. There are enough people to do pretty much whatever activity I want to do. And you have a decent amount of culture. I mean, he talks a lot about uh, how you don't want to be in an area that has no culture. And like, you don't want to be, you know, having to drive 200 miles to a Walmart. Uh, if you're in a city of that size, even if you're living in a suburb, like you're going to be able to, I mean, Birmingham is uh, on the smaller side, but even we have, you know, we have traveling plays come. We have a lot of food. We have a wide variety of different cuisines and concerts come here. There's, there is culture here. It's mm -hmm. not New York or San Francisco, but it does exist. It's enough for me. Uh, so in terms of things that I, I want, you know, Texas, I would say, as I've gotten older and I actually make money, I think about that more now too. Uh, but you would have asked me when I was, 22, I don't even think I would have really cared mm -hmm. uh, about the tax. Just, but maybe, maybe we just sort of, I mean, I, I feel like I, I feel like off air, we were kind of saying both of us didn't have a lot of attention teens to our early 20s. Uh, I, I definitely felt like I floated through life, not necessarily floated through all of my life, but I just kind of went with what I thought I should do next up and until I was probably 26 when I started grad school. Mm -hmm. And then when I started grad school, I, once I bought my house and I started renting out my rooms my house, I feel like I had a lot more intentionality with what I was doing. Yeah, I, I, I would say the, when I moved to Charlotte, that was like one of the first intentional things I really did. Um, and I think that's part of his point. Like we as a society have kind of just started um, flowing through life. Like, you know, you spend time with your parents at home, you go to college, you get a job, and that's just kind of the status quo. Like, and no one's really challenged it. And he's kind of saying, you know, why are you going to college when you have no clue what you want to do, no clue who you are? Why are you in a rush to go to college? Um, and kind well, of, so I, yeah, pu pushing back. I, I, I would, yeah, go ahead. So I, I agree with that. Like, I yeah. think you definitely should have a general idea of what you want to do when you go to college. Uh, he pokes fun at a lot of, I think I already mentioned one, he pokes fun at some of these degrees that people are coming out of college with. And I, I a hundred percent agree. I mean, they're unemployable or, I mean, who, who knows? Well, you don't have true employable skills. Like you're not really, I mean, if you're going to go work in some field where, you know, you don't need to really produce anything, you don't really need a technical skill, but he is right in that. Like if you're getting a, you know, not the, not the like rag on it, but if you're getting a like, lit, you know, uh, like feminist literature degree, probably not a whole lot of marketable skills with that degree. Mm -hmm. And then he, uh, he's, he's also yeah. kind of, and then the people that graduate college are perceived as like above the other people that didn't go to college. And then the people that didn't go to college kind of have this view that they're behind when their cohorts are now graduating college. But he's saying they, they shouldn't be jealous of those people because, you know, a lot of them are in debt have no real skill at that point and have had no work experience. 
Yeah, I get, get it. I, I agree with you. He actually, yeah. he actually more or less brought that up from a dating perspective in the book of numbers. He was saying yeah. like how most, at least if you're a man, most women would prefer a man that's a lawyer that makes less than a man that's a plumber. Just, I think he, he deemed it yeah. as the, uh, the prestige category. Like, yeah. Status. Yeah. It, it is more prestige or status if you have a degree. Uh, which it is what it is, I guess. Uh, I mean, some, I don't know some, if you've, uh, mm-hmm. I, I will say I definitely, there, there have been times when I've told people I have a PhD in chemistry and, and I would say there have been a couple instances in my life when women have found that very impressive. Mm. Uh, <laughs> I'm just gonna, I'm gonna leave <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I mean, what did you? Uh, so, so a couple of, like takeaways from this, and if if someone um, were thinking of doing a reconnaissance trip, he touches on being prepared or at least trying to get some skill on car maintenance. I thought that was a good lesson or perhaps do a lot of YouTube videos or find a person that can help you learn parts of the car. I I feel like I'm totally oblivious and inept with cars, but I, I would love to know more about them and you would feel more confident going on some of those really long drives. Um, especially in remote places if you don't have, yeah. and, and part of the thing comes also comes back to like planning, like some of these trips he's talking, I mean, especially his motorcycle. I think he said he had a 120 mile range on the motorcycle. So he had to plan out where the gas stations were and where the, the shops were that he could take it in if he was going to do some of these really long journeys. So he, he harps and preaches on, planning it out, you know, for an hour and hopefully that will save you days in the future if something were to break down. So I thought that was a good, good takeaway. I I, I agree. The other thing he brought up was if you're, if you're older, like just actually renting a car. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Cause you're probably, I think he said you're probably getting better gas mileage and you don't have the liability. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I, I for remember sure. When my, uh, when my, uh, when my car was, my car, uh, just for the listeners, my car was in the mechanic shop almost a year ago, and the mechanic shop was broken into. So the insurance company ended up getting me a rental, and I think this was when I drove. I drove one of the rental cars to Charlotte. I I think all in all, I put on close to like 5,000 miles on all the rental cars. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, got two of them definitely got oil changes, but it was the rental car that was doing it. Like the check engine light went on. I just brought the car back to the rental shop. It gave me a new car and I went on my way with a new one. (laughs) There you go. Uh, Yeah. What did, what did you think of his now now some now we we have done a road trip when we were younger through like Wyoming, Montana, South Dakota but his he was kind of an advocate for getting a a gun, a handgun. I I wanted to ask him uh resources to learn about guns and cuz I actually don't really know how that works if you're like carrying across state lines. Do you have any idea of that? I, I have no clue. I, I have it, no idea. <laughs> but, but I know. But he says, I know. Be, be wary of those uh, those people at the, I guess the the bars late at night around closing time in uh, you know, I guess parts of Wyoming or. <laughs> he brought up he brought up Wyoming specifically. I mean, I when I was reading this, I was like, dude, like, what have you at times? I'm like, what have you been doing at some point? <laughs> like, like, what parts of Wyoming are you in? You're making it sound like it's you know either you know the 1880s or you know you're in like you know a third world country. Like, there isn't. He then later on in the book goes on. To, it's not like lawlessness from wherever you are in America. There's still, 
I mean, granted, yeah, if you're, I mean, even if you're stranded in the upper peninsula of Michigan, like it's going to take someone a while to get to you. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, so I, don't think, mm-hmm. it, I don't think there are like, you know, I think he said meth heads, meth heads, yeah. or crackheads just running around. Like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't, I've never, I don't think I've, well, yeah, whatever part of Wyoming I've been to, it's a long, long time ago. Very small amount. But I don't know. So of the so, so the cool part, the practical part is, but it's also subjective. And, and he he acknowledges that this list is, you know, somewhat subjective and that you should explore on your own, but he's trying to help people out. Of the places he mentioned to go to, were there any spots that you're now saying like, okay, I want to go take a trip like here and explore like this part of the country? I mean, the fact that he highlighted the north side of Chicago, I was shocked by because more or less everything I feel like he says would have made him hate Chicago. Uh But then then he talks about how great the north side of Chicago is. Uh, I was, I, I was, I mean, I, I like, I like the North part of Chicago. Like I went to, a, I went to a Cubs game. I saw the Cubs lose like in Wrigleyville. Guess, like it, it was I, nice. I guess I don't know enough about the geography of Chicago. So I was kind of surprised by that. Uh, I mean, we have been to, we've been to the Badlands. We've been to Mount Rushmore. Those are all sure. cool. Yeah. We've been to the Grand Canyon. He highlighted for you, he highlighted Banff. Yeah. He said, uh, I think he said, yeah, he says Vegas is where you should start. I thought that was interesting. What did what did you think about that? That I was that like hot choice it sounded. I think that's that's a solid choice. And it's partially because there's no state income tax, partially because it's good proximity to a lot of other major areas like LA, San Diego. I mean, so you can get to the ocean pretty easily, like four or five hours. So that that's a that's a good draw, and it's. I mean, I th- I think it's a good pick. I mean, th- there is a lot to do in Vegas outside of the Strip, so a uh, lot, lot of cool hiking, and um, so I you know I thought that was a, a interesting pick, and yeah, I, I can see why he selected that. I, I would agree with what you just said. I, I would like to state that at one point I think he said Las Vegas was recession proof, mm-hmm. and. I kind of would like him to go look at the housing prices in and around <laughs> Las Vegas around, you know, between like 2006 and like 2009 and then come back and tell me if it's recession proof or not. Uh, yeah. Cause, cause, cause we do you remember all those like huge buildings they were building and then like the funding just stopped? Not, not only that, but I mean, <laughs> even, even some of dad's friends houses that live in and around Vegas, they like oh, right. cab overnight so mm-hmm. uh i guess because yeah, i that was a... yeah i was i was surprised by that that statement that it's recession proof because you would think like if people are strapped like one of the first things they're going to cut is like are like vacations entertainment right yeah, yeah. exactly so i was kind of sorry <laughs> and that that's its mo so um i i am intrigued by colorado i gotta say i i have not been to colorado I would imagine it's like Utah, um, and I did love Salt Lake City and the surrounding areas. I, I I could have seen myself living there. Like I liked how outdoorsy it was. I loved all the nature. I loved the scenery with the mountains. I loved being able to go to the hot springs. He does mention by Moab with Arch National Park. I have not been there, but that was one place like on my list now. Like okay, I, I want to go do another Utah trip. And I, I think I would like to go to Colorado. Um, you want to do another Utah trip yet? I'm going there in like four weeks. You should just come. <laughs> what, what, what day are you going there again, Al? <laughs> I, I get in very late Wednesday, August uh, 16th, and I leave very early Sunday, August the 20th. I'll, 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 take, I'll take a look. I don't, I, I, I'm supposed to... Uh, replace our floors that 18th and 19th i think but uh we'll, we'll see yeah i would I'd love to go to, to utah i mean i would like to go see the pacific northwest too i've never been 
I mean, he doesn't speak super highly of Washington, Oregon, but he said know, you know, he it's does, worth, worth, worth visiting. He, I guess. he does speak highly of Washington. He speaks poorly of Seattle, I thought. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I guess, I guess he was, he was speaking highly in terms of visiting, but not like living there. Um, or maybe I'm getting mixed up. That, that's kind of what I thought I, he said. I, I think. I think he said that Washington had no state income tax. Did I read that right? I could not believe that. that. I, I couldn't believe that either. I'm almost wondering, because this was written in 2016, I want to say. So maybe that's changed. Because I, I didn't think that was correct. Um, but yeah, I would I would love to do like Seattle, Portland, go into the, some of the desert in the eastern parts of those states. And also like Boise, I'm... I'd like to see some of Idaho. And he mentioned that Lake Allure, I think it's called, or it's got that like French name. I think it was um, Louise. Lake Louise, I think, is by Banff in Canada, I want to say. Because because I, I know of uh, Banff through the Banff Film Festival, but I actually have not been there. But yeah, I'm pretty, I, I think Lake Louise is uh, up near Banff. Um, yeah, Banff, Jasper Lake, Louise, Highway 93. Yeah. I mean, I remember at one point we were trying to map out an Alaska road trip. That that would have been uh, hardcore driving. It was, uh, uh, I still remember this, from my house in Ann Arbor, it was 66 hours to Anchorage by car. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, could do some recon there. Um yeah, but and, and I'd also like I, I actually never really thought too much of like Vermont and New Hampshire. I'm sure they're lovely. I they hadn't really crossed my mind, but he, he seemed to speak highly of New Hampshire in the sense of living there and being able to travel to all those other places that he wasn't too fond to live in. Uh, so I could also see doing like a Northeast uh, recon trip just for funsies. Cause I, I haven't really done that. I know you, you did the main uh, New Hampshire, Vermont through Canada, right? Uh, yeah. Rhode Island, Vermont, uh, hit up Boston, New York city, and then up to uh, Montreal and Quebec city. But yet again, like at that time I was 22, the thought of, uh, you know, which state pays the lowest in income taxes mm-hmm. was nowhere on my mind. Uh, mm-hmm. I wasn't thinking about that at all. Maine, Maine I liked. Maine was very, very nice. Vermont was very pretty. Uh, but the other cities, I mean, like when we were in when we were in Providence versus Boston, like yeah, I mean, I couldn't stand uh, Boston. Obviously, there's a lot of a lot of history, but the traffic just it just killed me. Like I couldn't. Same with New York City, like. Yeah, you have all this great stuff, but the thought of, uh, you know, the thought of like either paying an exorbitant amount of price to live walkable in New York City or the thought of, you know, slaving away, commuting for like an hour and a half each day, each way, just uh, is like soul crushing to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. even, Even like outside, I remember. And I was uh, talking with someone that were telling me, like, living close to an hour and a half outside of the city, like a one-bedroom apartment, obviously you could find something cheaper, but some pretty nice one-bedroom apartments an hour and a half out of the city were, like, three or four grand a month still. And that's just stupid expensive. Man. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a wild world out there. Choose your city wisely. <laughs> All right. So, okay. So you, you said, you mentioned San Diego, Austin. So like right yeah, now, so, so those Florida, so like those would be the cities you would kind of consider. And it's pretty heavily pickleball influenced, you're saying? Well, for those cities, I mean, realistically, if I was going to move, I'd probably move to be closer to like you. And mm-hmm. assume that Reyna would eventually migrate down as well as would my mom and dad. But for for those reasons, if uh, independent of family members, if I was going to move to different a different city, I would try and move to either South Florida 
Austin, Texas, or probably San Diego, yeah. Okay, interesting. With San Diego being a distant third. Mm-hmm. Even, you... even, uh-huh. even potentially like Wichita. There's a lot of good players in Wichita. In Kansas? Wichita, Kansas has a lot of good players, yeah. Really? Okay. That's odd. To me. I, I find that odd, but interesting. Okay. Um I, I don't think I don't think Kansas is scoring well on Aaron Clary's uh <laughs> but uh Yeah, I mean which Wichita would be a, also a distant third mm-hmm. to the other the other two, South Florida and Austin. Mm-hmm. So okay, so and I know we've we've talked about this a little bit, but like if you look back five years to now, most people would acknowledge they've changed a lot. But when they're forecasting forward, they don't really view their preferences changing. So how do people you think should they view the activities they like doing now? And how much did that influence the city that they live in? Well, that's a fair point. But Uh, I guess people could say you could just move if your preferences change that much. But um, Right, but like the the general, I I feel like the general things you like to do, like, you know, I would say five years ago, instead of, you know, playing pickleball all the time, I was playing pickup soccer. Mm -hmm. But I was, like, still being active. So, like, in five five years, am I going to be still playing, like, a ton of pickleball or am I going to be playing some other, like, sport? In five years, I would like to think that I'll probably have, like, a kid. So, probably Mm -hmm. won't be playing as many sports. But uh, I guess the point I'm making is I'm, like, still probably going to be active. So, I, I think still would want to focus on living in a warm climate city so I can mm-hmm. be active more. Sort of like what you said about like why you wanted to move to Charlotte or why you wanted yeah. to Charlotte originally. Yeah. Um, yeah. What you like, think, think about... Like, Go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, like, if you like doing, like, you know, intense rock climbing in five years, you know, where you may not be doing, like, you know, solo climbs up Islands, you're you're probably still going to want to be doing something active. So maybe just hiking or like general like trail walking. Mm-hmm. You're still going to want to live in generally the same type of place. Yeah. What did you think of this like tribalism sentiment that like if you're trying to do things that is against the mainstream that people around you will kind of like fight back and try to pull you back. Because he brings up some stories about kids who he's tried to help. And one was really like appalling. I thought there was a guy that wanted to go to school and basically his mom was living in section eight and forced him to, or like really made him feel bad about leaving because her payment would go down. And I kind of, I was just like, what? And, and I think he stayed. I don't. I, I don't think he actually got out. I think he stayed at home and let his mom continue getting that Section Eight payment at the higher rate. I, uh, yeah. There's just like these people around that will like try to pull you back, and it's like you know switching teams, like in sports too. Like people try to make you feel bad for. You know, cause why are you breaking away from our tribe, essentially? Like, well, you think you're better yeah. or like, so, like this type of questioning, I guess. I mean, that's, that's absolutely like, just think about, uh, I mean, I can give you, I can give you a couple of examples of that. Think about the last couple of years. Uh, you know, you're, you, you run around with a, you know, I'm not trying to make any, you know, no political statements, but I can make some generalizations in that you hang out with a highly educated group of people. Uh, so when, you know, the vaccines were mandated, I'm guessing most of your social group was probably very for the vaccines mandated. And I think you were against that. 
did you, you probably felt some, you, felt, you probably feel, felt a little ostracized, didn't you? I felt very pressured and I, I wouldn't have been so against getting the vaccine, but I had already gotten COVID. Like I think, well, I might've already gotten it twice by then. I can't remember or once. And yeah. So, but, but yeah, I, that was, that was, that was tough being pressured like that. Um, now, I'm, I'm not even talking about getting the vaccine. I, I was just, I was against the vaccine being mandated. Ah, yeah, yeah, and, sure. Yeah. And the, the people I was around were saying everyone should be forced to get it. Like, and they, yeah. And that caused, I mean, just that sentiment. Uh, I made the statement that I should be allowed to have people at my house. Vanderbilt was trying to get me to sign some document that said I couldn't have people over to my house. It was like, you couldn't have more than four people at your house. Uh Uh, I'm like, well, this this is, this is not their business. And this became a massive fight in my lab where I got into a pretty, you know, heated altercation with a couple of my coworkers saying like, they were like, yeah, you shouldn't be having people at your house. I was like, that's not the point. They shouldn't be dictating what I can do at my house. Um, Mm -hmm. So, you know, whenever you step outside, you know, I guess like the group norms, people in the group, yeah, push back on you. Um, Mm -hmm. I I would say that's pretty uniform. And I feel like it's really really come out in the last couple of years. People are really starting to see that. I mean, yeah, that that sec that's the the guy with the section in his mom was a an unfortunate story. I mean, there were there were some good stories. Aaron Clary mentioned too. There was an Iranian kid. His parent, I think it was Iran. Iran. Yeah, um, Iran. The, the the parents sent him to America to become a doctor. You know, early on, I, I think he had problems with dealing with blood and said, "I don't want to become a doctor. I'm going to become a chemical engineer." And basically, the family like cut him off. There's the, like. No, but but the the kid stayed in America and made it work. Like, uh, so there were some good stories uh, that Aaron Clary Aaron Clary shared also. So that was uh, good to see that. Uh, yeah, some young people are taking some initiative. Uh, so that was pretty cool. Yeah, so I guess the I guess the last thing we sort of talked about this. One of the last questions I really had was. He says you need to answer where do I want to live before what do I want to do? Uh, I guess what's your, what's your thoughts on that? I think, you know, the overall city and landscape and the things it offers inherently, you know, you, you can kind of bank on like if, if there's mountains in a city, um, you know, that provides hiking, that provides good outdoor activities, and that will not change most likely over time. So I think from that perspective, and there, there might be some sort of um, industry in that city that I, I guess could change. And I mean, nothing certain, but a, a lot of, I, I, I kind of like the idea of picking where you live because that um it just that's kind of the backdrop to your life i mean you're you're spending more time out of work than in work most likely and you want to enjoy the city that you're in so i i would say that it's a good use of your time to focus on what city do i want to live in um i mean i yeah i mean perhaps we got kind of lucky how we ended up in certain cities, but uh, because we didn't really go on a a recon trip per se. Um, Never would have. In Mm -hmm. in a way I sort of did because uh, I did take, he he also made a point. No one, uh, when he was talking about Tennessee, he says no one wants to road trip to Alabama. And I in fact did take a road trip to Alabama (laughs) when I was living in Nashville. I took a, I took a uh, December of so right around Christmas of 2019. I took a would have been I think two weeks before Christmas. 
I took a four day weekend, which mm-hmm. I guess isn't maybe necessarily enough time uh, to really know the city, but it was enough time for me to hit up most of the main uh, most of the main attractions of Birmingham as a city, and for me to know that I I liked the city, I enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. I was like, I could definitely live here. So okay. That, that, that yeah. did give me a lot of confidence knowing that I would kind of enjoy living here, or at least living here, enjoy it enough. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah, so, so maybe you are a reconnaissance man now. Uh, and I, you know, I had been, well, Na- when I moved to Nashville, I moved for different reasons, but I, I had taken, uh, I had been in Nashville a couple times, but I didn't really, uh, when I physically moved there, I didn't really care. Mm-hmm. The things Nashville was known for, I didn't really care about at all. I don't really have any interest in country music, which is what it's really known for. I mm-hmm. could, I could have cared less about that. Yeah. Okay, Alan Bear. So, closing thoughts. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, it was a good book. Easy to get. It was real easy to get through. I think. Uh, I think it was like 200 pages, but I mean, you can read it. His writing's pretty easy. You can read it pretty quickly. Uh, good, good spacing on, on the font, which I always like. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I have to say, I like picked up, I, uh, I picked up Alice Shrug the other day, just a page through it. And I was like, oh my God, how is it like, you know, you probably lose your place on the page. You know, you probably uh-huh. have to just end up rereading every line. Like, uh, it's everything so close together. It's like impossible. Uh-huh. <laughs> but, uh huh. So I found that I I am thoroughly enjoying these books that have, have the more spacing between the words. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's interesting idea. I I do I do agree with him some. Uh, some some of the criteria, like I said, I thought was a little. Uh, thought the criteria for what states he he uh, got rid of seemed to be a little arbitrary at times based on the weather, but <laughs> otherwise, yeah, I, I think, I think it's definitely important. Like, I don't think you should just, you know, I mean, maybe, maybe in some regard you and I walked out because we had just sort of seems like we were both pretty good at very specialized things. So when we went to college, it kind of just, it maybe directed us to those paths that gave us very specialized, you know, jobs. But, uh, yeah, I could see, I definitely agree with if you shouldn't go to college, if you don't have at least a general idea of, uh, what you're going to do. I I guess, let me ask you this question, but like when you went to college, like, what did you think you must've had some idea of like what you were gonna do after you graduated. I mean, I'm actually so when I was in high school, I mean, I kind of thought I would be a doctor, but then after luckily I took that human physiology class. I think my it was either second semester junior or senior year, and I just could not do the dissecting stuff. I just it, I it disgusted me. I couldn't take this the smell. I'm just like, there's no way I would get through medical school. And from there, I just, I just cut it. Like, there's no chance. I mean, and I, I still, I think kind of kept the door open a little bit by taking in college, a summer class in chemistry. Cause you know, you got to take the chemistry things. But um, I mean, I, I figured I would major in math, but I, I had no clue what, what I would do with that. It not being a doctor. So I, I also kind of, I mean, I ended up meeting a person through my fraternity that was an actuary major or an actuarial science major. And then I ended up taking a night class and I ended up liking it enough to pursue it a little, but I honestly didn't know anything about the job. I mean, I had no internships or no clue what the actual day-to-day activity was. And I, I can confidently say the exams are different than the day-to-day. And I think 
I, I somewhat fell in love with the exam process instead of, well, I, well, I didn't know what the work was like. I, I thought I would like it, but um, I, I didn't really know. But I, I did like studying and learning those types of concepts on the actuarial exams. But I, I didn't really know what I would do. And I, I picked up econ during college. So I remember taking that first econ class and really liking it. I was like, okay, I think I'm going to also major in econ. But I, I really had no clue what I wanted to do. And I, I think I would have benefited from maybe taking a year or two off, definitely. Um, but, easy, I mean, it's easy to say now, I guess. Um, but, I it you know, worked worked out okay, I'd say. so. Um, but you didn't know you wanted to be a chemist going into college, did you? Because you... I felt like for you, it kind of clicked when you took organic chemistry or is that uh, not right? No. So like, well, I guess just based off of that, talking about uh, you taking that summer, summer chemistry class, I think that is the only, the only time I ever helped you with a course. I, <laughs> I remember, I remember going over uh, geometries with you of, of compounds because I think you took that after I took AP Chem. But yeah, when I went to, uh, I remember when I was in college, it was just like, oh, I'm like good at science. Like I just, you know, I know like a lot of science. I'm like kind of okay at math. Like I should go to med school. Like when I started college, I definitely thought I was going to go to med school. And really even, even after, uh, yeah, once I took Orgo, oh, I was like, I'm going to major in chemistry or biochemistry is what I ended up majoring in, which is functionally the same. Uh, I just needed like three less classes. But I think even after that point, I was still like, I'm going to probably uh, still go to med school. And I tried to go to med school. Uh, but it was really after I started working, I would say, and when I worked at a university, I kind of was like, okay, I could, I could maybe, I think I could see myself being a professor. Like, I think mm -hmm. I would like that lifestyle. Uh, and then after going through grad school, I rid myself of any notion of wanting to be a research professor. I, I would still, I, I could still see myself teaching, but in a non-research uh, lab, I don't think I would, I, I can safely say, I have no interest in running a research group, but I do, I do thoroughly enjoy teaching chemistry. So I would mm -hmm. be open to being like a lecturer or a, like an adjunct professor or just a professor uh, mm -hmm. that doesn't have my own lab. But yeah, I mean, the, the parts, the parts of chemistry that I really like are uh, unfortunately not really the physically doing it. Uh, which is always very hard and laborious, but I like thinking about it, and I like—I actually do like talking about it. Uh, hmm. Do you think you could have seen yourself going into like a like a trade, like a welder, plumber, electrician, like right out of high school? Could you have seen, looking back, maybe that working for you or not really? Yeah, I I think that would have been a great choice. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think that there's there's zero chance that 18 year old me would have had the wherewithal to know that. Uh, mm -hmm. I I, often, I I feel like I tell this story a lot. I don't know if you feel the same way, but the people in our high school that took those classes, I, I was scared of. Me too. They were mean. Uh, they, some of them were mean to me. <laughs> same, right. Same. They were they were mean. You know, they talked about like drinking and doing drugs a lot. It kind of you know, they had all these piercings. Uh, I, I was I was actually scared of them. And to me, they kind of looked like degenerates and I didn't want anything to do with them. So I don't know. Dad always, Dad always tells that story about how his grandfather would hire someone to like hang up a picture, like to pound in a nail and hang up a picture. Mm -hmm. And he just sort of said like, this is like, you know, work for like nine Jews. And I, I kind of, I kind of had that when I was 18 and I kind of had that mentality. I was like, this type of work is, you know, 
work for you know non-Jews, which is not a great uh, mentality to have. I, I wish I would have taken uh, more of those classes. I think we had like small engine repair. Yeah, like yeah, we did. Yeah. yeah, I I really wish I would have taken those classes now. Yeah. Uh, um, well, yeah. Well, Jack, do you have any other uh, any other thoughts? I don't think so. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I really enjoy Aaron Clary's writing. He's very concise, to the point, practical. You could tell he's trying to do good in the world, and I like that, and trying to make people think on things that they don't normally think about and challenging the status quo. So I, I think that's all good. So I'm a big Aaron Clary fan, and hopefully we'll finally get him on soon. Hopefully, and what uh, have we decided? What book of his we're gonna do? Uh, I don't know, Al. Have we? <laughs> I think I think that's still up in the air. Yeah. But with but with that said, please reach out to us at uh, brothersonbooks at gmail dot com for any book recommendations, or if you would like to be a guest host for a particular book you have in mind. A great review rating on whichever platform you're listening to would be greatly appreciated. And lastly, if you can think of any friend, family member, or coworker that might like this episode, please pass it along. Also, buy that matcha, Encha Matcha, the best matcha. Uh, so with that said, yeah, Jack, was a good pick. Uh, nice. As always, it's been a pleasure chatting. I think we had a good discussion. Mm -hmm. And our, our next book, we're going back to our, our classics. And this is the book that I chose. Slaughterhouse Five by uh, Kurt Vonnegut. So I think with that beauty. Said, yep. I will see you next time. See you next time.